This is without doubt the worst season of True Detective and it's not even a competition. Season 2 is a fucking masterpiece in comparison. I simply cannot understate what a train wreck Night Country is. The plot is an absolute mess, none of the characters are likeable, the story is as convoluted as it is stupid, and now we have ghosts and zombies. What? Yes, you heard that right, there are now ghosts and zombies in True Detective, and they're retarded. Night Country or Season 4 has problems which plague most of modern media, which is that it's retarded, boring and spiteful. It's retarded because the story is an absolute mess, completely filled with plot holes. It's boring because it's full of irrelevant characters that do fuck all. And it's spiteful because almost every person in this is an unlikable cunt. But what is easily the worst part of this show are the two main characters, Jodie Foster and this bitch. And in terms of how unlikable they are, they are on par with Galadriel from the Rings of Power and Mindy Calling's Brown Velma. No! God, please, no! They do not have a single redeeming feature that the audience can identify with. They are corrupt, petty, incompetent girl bosses that act like immature children and treat every man they come across like shit simply because they are suffering from penis envy. They also have no chemistry together. They're not funny and everything they say is retarded. Jodie is just an aging Karen who does nothing but bitch and complain, and we even see her in a horrific sex scene that I wish I could forget between her and Doctor Who. Her partner is an Eskimo, Inuit, or whatever the fuck they are called cop that looks like she has just lost a fight with a stapler. She has a resting bitch face and a bad attitude to go with it, no doubt trying to emulate a tough guy. But she's a small woman, so when we see her beating multiple men twice her size, it's embarrassing to watch. I don't care if she's a boxer in real life, all of these men would fucking destroy her. How embarrassing. Issa Lopez is the writer behind this and it's so obvious that she is trying and failing to write these two women as men. But because of how she clearly doesn't understand male behaviour, they end up becoming a parody of what a man is. They are extremely violent, insult everybody they come across, and treat regular people like shit for no reason. What's worse is that she has written all of the male characters to behave like weak and helpless women in order to make these two more masculine than the men. In fact, most of the time they are either in the kitchen cooking meals for their girlfriends, trying to talk about their feelings or begging them to come back to bed. The surrounding cast aren't any better, they are either Eskimo activists wanting the white people to go back where they came from or are completely pointless. The only character that isn't a complete asshole is Peter, but he's the standard effeminate white male sidekick that listens to all the women, a trope we see so very often in shows like this. He does most of the real work and gets none of the credit. He saves the day multiple times because he's the only competent person on the police force. He has a bad dad, obviously, and the only masculine role model in his life that he can look up to is, of course, Jodie Foster. <sighs> The writing is dog shit wrapped up in cat shit, which is why supernatural elements have been forced into the story to cover up all the mistakes. As I said before, we now have ghosts in the story, and they are doing this. What the fuck was that? We have a man coming back to life despite being frozen solid for three days. One moment, he's a zombie that cannot talk. <laughs> But the next he can. She's waiting for you. Why? True Detective is no longer an intelligent, gritty, realistic crime drama, but a supernatural mess. The story is so hilariously bad that they've had to incorporate the undead into this to prevent the show from falling apart. There are many times these two assholes end up being helped out by a ghost who will leave them a physical clue, and yet these ghosts never tell them just who the fuck the killers are when they so easily could. Well, that's just silly. Silly, yes. Idiotic, yes. Season 4 feels nothing like True Detective, and I was wondering what the fuck happened to the show. 
And after doing some research, it turns out that Nick Pitalato, the guy who wrote the original season, has more or less been pushed out. He's just the executive producer at this point. He's not the writer, director, nor the showrunner. No, the architect of this disaster belongs to a woman called Isa Lopez. So how does Nick feel about being replaced and his franchise being bastardised beyond all recognition? Well, a quick glance at his now deleted Instagram posts, and we can see that he has been reposting negative reviews of Night Country, and also people apologising for being so harsh in Season 2, because Season 4 is that bad. Oh wait, you serious? Let me laugh even harder. <laughs> I wonder what set him off. Maybe it was the corporate shill media spouting off such obvious lies, like this finale being better than season one, or that despite this being absolute dog shit, this embarrassment has been viewed more times than the original season. What a bunch of corrupt fucking cunts. Now, the showrunner herself was asked how her season is different from the original, and she said, where True Detective is male and sweaty, Night Country is cold, dark, and female. Right. What she fails to mention, however, is that Night Country is also obsessed with racism, like every other fucking TV series that comes out nowadays. Wouldn't have happened if she was white, though. They would have had the whole fucking police force out looking for a white ass. It's called Muckluck Telegraph. Not for white boys. You need to shut the fuck up! And therein lies the problem. The focus of season one was on telling a good story, whereas Night Country would rather pander and race bait the audience instead of trying to entertain them. No way! No way! So, with all that said, I'm going to break down the plot episode by episode and show you why it's so god fucking awful. Episode 1 begins with the hunter about to shoot some badly CGI deers before the last sunset of the year happens. The deers, who must be psychic, sense the evil that is about to come and they just decide to throw themselves off a cliff and die. Why? We then cut to a research base full of dudes and one of the guys is a man called Clark who says she's awake before the power goes off and everyone disappears. The only thing left behind was the tongue of a woman that died six years ago, and despite this tongue being the plot device that sets everything in motion, it never gets explained as to how it got here. That's fucking stupid! The showrunner herself admits that she left it ambiguous, and that's because she had no fucking idea how to put it here logically, so she didn't even bother trying, because she's a fucking moron. You'll find this happens a lot throughout the episodes. Any unanswered questions you have will be, Oh, a ghost did it. That's so fucking lazy. We then get our first look at one of the main characters, Agent Navarro, who shows up to an assault where an old woman has knocked out a young man with a metal bucket. When asked why she did this, the old woman replies that it's because he has been allegedly hitting his girlfriend, which is the woman right next to her. Don't let the bandage fool you, she cut herself on the job. Did he? No, that's just the job. The guy wakes up from lying in a pool of his own blood as no one even bothered to check if he was okay and tries to attack the old woman. Navarro being the absolute girl boss she is easily overpowers this man who is much bigger than her because of course she can. She then ends up arresting him, the victim of the assault, because she just believes this old woman's story despite no evidence to support it. These accusations are just hearsay. However, there is plenty of evidence of the old woman attacking this man with a weapon. Everyone saw it and she herself even admits to doing it. Did you or did you not hit this man with a metal bucket? Yeah, yeah I'm right I hit him with a metal bucket. But because of Believe All Women, this guy is the one to get arrested even though he is the victim of an assault. What a bitch. We are then introduced to Jodie Foster's character who arrives at the research base to investigate the disappearance. She finds the tongue, and after establishing that the food is a few days old, she thinks everyone has been gone for at least three days. She takes a quick look around the base, but that's it. She does not dust for fingerprints or check for hairs, which is a massive problem by the time the finale rolls around, but I'll explain that later. Jodie starts investigating who this tongue belongs to, but is interrupted by a phone call from a distressed parent, as apparently Jodie's adopted daughter Leah, who's 17 years old, has been making a porno with her daughter, who's only 15. 
That's fucking disgusting. Now her adopted indigenous daughter has just been caught making a sex video with an underaged girl, but the only thing Jody is angry about is that the girl's mother forced her to watch it. Of you screwing a 15 year old girl, you made a video that I had to watch. Her daughter is a groomer and no one sees a problem with this in the entire show. Well, this whole paedophile discussion comes to an abrupt end when a drunk driver just happens to speed past. Her daughter being a degenerate fuck is never brought up again, probably because someone in the writer's room recognised this whole storyline would make them look like Vosh. You can see this is an example of the kind of structure that I'm referring to. We cut back to Navarro, who's talking to a man about her time in the army, and during her tour, she just so happened to be talking to a guy with half his head missing. What? He whispers something very important in her ear, so profound this is that it made her religious. So what did he say? Don't know, it's never revealed. Afterwards, we see her overpowering her boyfriend during sex, because he's the bitch in the relationship. The only real reason this is even here is to make her come across as the man in the relationship. It's why when she leaves for work, he wants her to stay in bed with him. On the way, however, she spots the guy she falsely arrested. She overhears him calling his ex a bitch. Now, he has made no threats or has admitted to hitting her. The only thing he says is that when she comes crawling back to him, he's gonna fuck her. But simply talking about a woman like that is enough to trigger Navarro, who pours liquid sugar into his truck engine, destroying his car. Why are you the way that you are? It's funny how a lot of people would hate this if it was a man doing it to a woman, but absolutely love it because it's the opposite. Nothing else really happens for most of the episodes, so little in fact that we end up watching people watching paint dry. So the tongue ends up belonging to some Eskimo activist that died six years ago, and Navarro accuses the police of being racist because they didn't investigate her death. Wouldn't have happened if she was white though. The episode comes to an end when this woman, who can very conveniently see ghosts, decides to follow this random one out into a blizzard in the middle of the night, and it does this. What the fuck am I watching? It then points to the dead bodies of the research team, and that's episode one. Episode two begins with Jodie Foster and her retarded police force fucking around with the dead bodies, even breaking pieces off them. Why is everyone so fucking stupid? Now, despite Jody herself recognising that they have no forensic experts available and are clearly unprepared to carry out this investigation, she for no reason refuses to send these people to Anchorage, where the real experts are. An officer snaps the arm off one of the bodies and it starts moaning. <laughs> Now, apparently this is not a zombie, despite the fact he has been frozen solid for three days. His blood has turned to ice, and yet somehow they're saying he's still alive. So they take the not zombie to the hospital, but he falls into a coma. Jody tries to figure out what these researchers were up to, but it's difficult because they never left their base, nor did they talk to anyone from the town. Luckily for her, however, this random science teacher that she used to fuck just so happens to have all the answers. Oh, how convenient! He says that these researchers, who are supposed to be measuring pollution from the local mine, have been secretly trying to unearth magic DNA that can do anything. This is top secret information, so much so that the research base is being secretly funded through multiple shell companies, and yet somehow this random fucking science teacher seems to know about this. How? How the fuck does he know this? I don't know. Anyway, back at the station, the police captain played by Doctor Who shows up and wants the bodies moved to Anchorage because this police department is useless. He's absolutely right. But Jodie refuses to do so, saying that they need to be thawed first before she can move them, which gives her 48 hours to solve the case. But with no leads, Jodie is stuck. However, in an extremely contrived manner, a ghost just so happens to have visited the psychic woman and drew her a symbol in the snow, which she then relayed to Navarro, who says that the same symbol is on one of the bodies. Now I know what you're thinking, why didn't the ghost just tell her the names of the people who killed these men? Well, that's a question you're going to be repeating several times throughout this review. Peter manages to unlock one of the dead people's phones using their fucked up faces to do so. Now, I'm sceptical that face would unlock the phone, but whatever. 
A bunch more boring stuff happens, like Jodie Foster getting fucked by Doctor Who, or her groomer daughter continuing to molest underage kids, before they eventually find a dead girl with a missing tongues phone. They give it to Peter to break into, since he does everything, and the episode ends with them discovering that Clark, one of the researchers, is still alive. Episode 3 starts with a manhunt for Clark, before we then learn that in the past, Jodie and Navarro used to be partners, but they split up when they worked on a certain case that involved a guy killing his wife. Now, it's incredibly obvious that they murder him and cover it up, but this scene keeps being repeated throughout multiple episodes, like it's building up to a big reveal, but this surprise twist fails completely because of how predictable it is. They eventually learn about a man called Oliver who used to work at the research base, but he's now somewhere out in the wilderness hunting. And in another case of extreme luck, Navarro's boyfriend just so happens to know where to find him. Well, isn't that convenient? They do find Oliver, but he tells the pair of them to fuck off, and that's it. They have wasted a whole episode chasing this guy for nothing. What a fucking waste of time. Anyway, a bunch more pointless shit happens, like Leah joining a group of racist Eskimos who tell the white miners to go back where they came from. They also paint over their mouths, which is no doubt trying to reference the red handprint, which is often used by indigenous feminists. They get a call which says that the zombie is now awake from his coma, but he can't speak at all. But when everyone except for Agent Navarro leaves the room, the zombie sits up and does this. She's waiting for you. Why is the zombie saying this and not telling us who did this to him? Well, him waking up from his coma was utterly pointless, as he doesn't tell anybody what happened to him and just dies for the second time. The episode ends with Peter unlocking another phone, this time belonging to the girl who died, and this one has a cryptic video of her death. Episode 4 starts with Jodie once again having no leads, so she gets Peter to search for someone else who has had similar injuries to the dead bodies. Jodie thinks that finding some random person that has also suffered extreme hypothermia will somehow help her solve the case, and despite all logic and common sense, Jodie ends up being right. The only dude who fits the bill is a man called Otis, who just so happens to be the only person alive that can help her find and navigate the treacherous network of ice caves to find the exact place where the girl died. How convenient. We then have even more boring filler, where we see Leah, who is now a part of Eskimo Antifa, vandalising a building. She once again avoids punishment, but still gets angry at her mother for telling her off. Why do you always take their side? Why are you being such a bitch? We cut to Navarro checking her mentally ill sister into a voluntary facility that cannot hold people against their will. And after she has an episode, she checks herself out and walks into the dark to die. Navarro is surprised that this happened and starts taking it out on the innocent desk clerk who was only doing his job. This isn't a detention center, it's a, it's a voluntary facility. Well, it's a shit fucking facility! Unsurprisingly, she blames everyone else but herself, even though she should have already known when she checked her sister in that this place cannot legally hold people against their will because it's a voluntary center. So, acting like the child she is, she starts to smash the place up. What the fuck? I hate so much about the things that you choose to be. She then drives home feeling sorry for herself before seeing the guy she falsely arrested and whose car she vandalized. Being the absolute chad he is, he puts a finger right up to her. And even though Navarro is supposed to be a police officer, she gets out of her car and sucker punches him. What's more annoying is that the writers keep trying to make her a girl boss, so we end up seeing these three men who are much bigger than her struggle to restrain her, which is laughable, but thankfully they do. So the three of them beat the shit out of her and are instantly my favourite characters. Navarro goes to her boyfriend's house and even though she's the one who was injured, he's the one who looks like he's about to cry. What are you, gay? The next day they find out that Otis is a crackhead and has been living in an abandoned dredge with no heating in the middle of an Alaskan winter. Bullshit. Yep, somehow this crackhead has survived sleeping in sub-zero temperatures for over a decade. After a brief chase, Otis gives himself up and the episode ends with Navarro's ear bleeding simply because because they needed a stupid cliffhanger. Episode 5 starts with Peter's wife kicking him out of the house because he is doing all the work at the station and not making time for his family. He's the only competent cop in the entire police force. What the fuck else is he supposed to do? 
We then cut to Eskimo Antifa attacking the mines and they start getting violent, but when Leah throws oil on a cop, she is surprised to find out that assaulting an officer has consequences. Leah then realises something very obvious, which is that all activists are performers that don't actually care. They have no real moral convictions, so everyone, including her underage girlfriend, leave her to be beaten. Unfortunately, the hand of justice is stopped when Navarro starts punching the officer. They keep trying to make her this badass fighter, but it's so forced. More annoyingly, however, is that even though she has attacked another officer, she doesn't get fired or even disciplined because the rules just don't seem to apply to her. Meanwhile, Peter, the only useful character, figures out that the owners of the mine are also stakeholders in the research station. Jesus Christ, why isn't Peter the protagonist? Well, because the writers hate strong male characters, that's why. Fast forwarding through more filler, the ninth doctor ends up telling Jodie that her investigation is over, but when Jodie tells this to Navarro, she yet again throws another temper tantrum and frees Leah from her cell. No other cop even tries to stop her from breaking the law. Ah. We then see the owner of the mines ordering Peter's dad to kill Otis, so he stalks Jodie, and even though she realises what he's up to, she just fucking goes home and leads him right to him. Are you fucking retarded? Peter's dad kills Otis before Peter shows up and kills his father in order to save Jodie. Navarro shows up afterwards and tells Peter to meet the old woman who can see ghosts, as she will help him dispose of his father's body and help cover up this murder. But why would any woman want to do that? Why would she do this? She barely knows who Navarro is and has never met Peter. No one would incriminate themselves like this for complete strangers. It makes no fucking sense. But then again, nothing has in this show. Also, the mine owner who ordered the assassination is completely forgotten about and never mentioned again. Wow, that's really lazy. Anyway, we move on to the finale, where we have the pair of them enter the ice caves where the girl died, and it turns out that the magic DNA they were digging for was from a prehistoric dinosaur that is stuck in the ice. It's also revealed that this cave is located directly below the research station. So it turns out that Clark was hiding in this cave during the investigation, and he is now running around the research base trying to kill the pair of them. They chase after him and split up, and because he's a ninja, he manages to trap Jodie in a freezer with a glass door. Jodie has a gun filled with bullets, and yet she doesn't even attempt to shoot the door. No, she just wastes a load of time trying to find a metal pipe to smash it. Shoot the fucking door, you moron. Christ, who wrote this? So because of Jodie's incompetence, Clark manages to get away and sneak up on Navarro, knocking her out with a fire extinguisher. And even though he is trying to kill her, he doesn't. Instead, he just drags her by her feet. But Clark underestimates just how much of a girl boss Navarro is, who manages to wake up despite having a massive concussion and easily overpowers him before beating him up. Clark is then tied up and asked what the fuck is going on. He says that the magic DNA that can do anything is trapped in the ice, and the only way to get at it is to have the local mines purposefully pollute the soil, as that will somehow weaken the ice and help them extract the DNA. That doesn't make any sense. How the fuck does pollution, which is giving some of the townspeople cancer, not destroy the DNA? Also, it's trapped in ice. Why don't they just use heat to thaw it out like every other excavation does? Why? I tell you why. I don't know. Anyway, Clark explains what happened to the dead girl. You see, they were both dating, and inexplicably, she found out about the secret cave, figured out what the DNA was, and that they were using pollution to free it, all by herself. So she starts to destroy the equipment, and one of the scientists turns feral, stabbing the girl a dozen times. Isn't that a little extreme? Maybe. The other six researchers then show up, and do you know what they do? Well, they just join in and start stabbing the fuck out of her. Why? Why would you do that? What the fuck is wrong with these scientists? This is the very first thing they do. They all just join in and stab this girl, who, might I add, is stabbed 32 times. Clark is upset by this, but what's funny is that his girlfriend comes back to life and Clark suffocates her. 
First the zombie, now this. People have come back from the dead more times than Jesus. So the scientist and the mine owner want to keep her death a secret, so how do they do it? Well, they get Peter's dad to dump her body where it can be easily found, and also cut her tongue out to send a message to no one. He cuts her tongue out for no reason. That very tongue is then transported by a ghost onto the floor of a research base, just so that it could be found by Jodie Foster. This is some of the most ridiculous and far-fetched nonsense I have ever seen. After listening to a story, we see Navarro about to shoot him as Jodie leaves the room. We hear a bang, and Jodie says that if she didn't kill him, then she would've. But later on, it turns out that she didn't shoot him. No, she cut him free where he ran outside and immediately froze to death five meters from the door. Jodie berates Navarro for letting him die as they needed him to be a witness, when not five minutes ago, she said that if she didn't kill him, then she would have. But this retardation only gets worse, as it turns out that Navarro has already recorded his confession, but she doesn't tell Jodie about it, and they keep arguing. There is absolutely no point as to why these people are arguing. This is nothing more than forced drama to pad out the episode. The rest of the finale is them stuck in the research base with no power. We see Navarro and Clark able to see each other at different moments in time, which is why he says she's awake at the beginning, because he saw her in the future. Yes, that's correct. Time distortion is now in True Detective. Is anyone even shocked by this? At this point, I wouldn't even be surprised if fucking Harry Potter showed up. Eventually, Navarra walks out into a blizzard, where she speaks to her mother's ghost, who reveals her fucking stupid Eskimo name. Who gives a shit? Not who killed the researchers, because that's not important, but her dumb fucking Eskimo name. That's gay. <laughs> Jodie tries to follow Navarro, but ends up falling through the ice. This should be game over. There is no heat, she is old and in the middle of a blizzard. But hypothermia means nothing in this show, so she ends up being fine. Now, despite having access to this base for over a week, only now does Jodie start using UV light to check for fingerprints, and she discovers that it was all of the Eskimo women in the village that killed the researchers. I'd say that sounds pretty retarded. So it turns out that one day, a cleaner knocked over a bucket, which helped her find a secret hatch. It's not locked, because of course it isn't, and she climbs into the cave where she finds the murder weapon that they kept for no reason. Somehow she and every cleaner are able to piece together that this tool is the very murder weapon used to kill that girl, and how could they possibly know this? I guess these middle-aged women are also forensic experts, because they somehow get access to police reports that tell them such. On the night of the disappearance, an all-female Eskimo posse storms the base like they're the fucking SAS and rounds up the researchers. They force them into a truck, have them strip naked, and cast them out into the wild, killing them. Just when I think you couldn't possibly be any dumber. You go and do something like this. Yes, the big mystery of this show is that a large group of Eskimo feminists killed all of these men. No fucking way that these people would have been able to clean up after themselves. Look at all the evidence they would have left behind. We would have had footprints and handprints everywhere, as most of them aren't even wearing gloves. Loose hair would have been found all over the place, and the sheer mess they made would have been impossible to cover up. I don't fucking care if they're house cleaners. There is no fucking way they could have cleaned up after 30 people running around the base touching everything. A forensic expert would have found something if only Jodie had decided to get one, but she didn't as the entire case would have been solved in the first episode. Well, good going, stupid! Now that the mystery has been solved, what do our so-called heroes do? Do they arrest these murderers? No, they just agree to help cover up this massacre. They do? Of course they do! Now, we all know the real reason why these women get away with murdering seven men, and that's because they're women of colour. After this, they use the recorded confession of Clark, who is very clearly bloodied and bruised, as so-called evidence to get the government and all the multi-billion dollar companies to stop digging for the magic DNA. There are many reasons why this wouldn't work, but here are the main two. His confession is clearly under duress and therefore inadmissible at court. But more importantly, this is magic DNA that can do anything. Why the fuck would all these powerful people stop digging for it? 
What would actually happen is that these two women and all the other feminists in the village would be arrested, then they would kill themselves, the very same way Epstein did. But this show is retarded so none of that happens. Instead, they close down the mines, and the final scenes are of Navarro walking out into the wild. Jodie and her groomer daughter now get along, despite the fact that the animosity between the two characters was never resolved, and these two piece of shit detectives just get to live happily ever after, even though they close down the mines which employed half the town, and what happens to all these people now that they can no longer earn a living? Well, nobody seems to give a shit, and that was True Detective Night Country. Worse than hell. So the real villains of the show won. These corrupt, murdering, racist psychopaths get to live happily ever after. Fuck this show. The writing is dog shit, the acting is terrible, the dialogue is horrific, and the characters are more toxic than the Kool-Aid at Jonestown. This show was mostly filler, with race-baiting bullshit sprinkled throughout the story, which of course got the critics on board because they don't actually watch this shit. But what's worse than all that is that these people are going to fail upwards and get another season, because this embarrassment was watched more times than season one. Anyway, that was True Detective Night Country. It's a piece of shit. <laughs>